Tene Brahma Hidaya Adikavaye Muyanti Atsura Yaha Tejo Vari Madam Yata Vini Mayo Yatra Trisargo Mesha Damna Svena Sada Dirasta Kuhakam Satyam Param Di Mahi O my Lord, Sri Krishna, son of Vasudeva. O my Lord, Sri Krishna, son of Vasudeva. Oh, personality of God. Oh, pervading personality of God. Offer my respectful base to you. Offer my respectful base to I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute truth. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute truth. And a primeval cause of all causes. Of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universes. Mm. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. And he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge onto the heart of Brahmaji. The original living being. By him even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. As one is bewildered by the illusory representations of water seen on fire or land seen on water. <clears throat> by him, even uh, only because of him do the material universes temporarily manifested by the reactions of the three modes of nature appear factual, although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna, who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode, which is forever free from the illusory representations in the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. Dharma Projita Kaitravotra Paramo Nimatsaranam Satam Vedyam Vastava Matra Vastu Shivadam Tapa Trayon Bulana Shimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite Kimva Prayer Ishwaraha Sadyo Hridi Avaridhyate Tra Krite Bihi Susu Sabis Takshana Complete rejecting all the religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth, which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity is sufficient in itself for God realization. What is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam, by this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nigama kalpaturur galitam falam Sukumakad amrita dravya samyutam Pibata bhagavatam rasam alayam Mohur aho raska bhuvi bhavakaha O expert and thoughtful man, relish shimad bhagavatam The mature fruit of the desire tree of Vedic literatures it emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadeva Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Although its nectarian juice was already relishable for all, including, including liberated souls. Shinvatam Svakuta Krishna Punya Shravana Kirtana 
Yudhyam Taksto Hi Abhadrani Vidunati Suhit Satam To hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures or to hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita is it self-righteous activity. And for one who hears about Krishna, Lord Krishna who is dwelling in everyone's heart, acts as a best wishing friend and purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. Nasta preesu bhadresu nityam bhagavata sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Sloke, Bhakti Bhavati Naistiki. In this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam and from the devotees, he becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. Tadarajas Tamo Bhava. Kama loba dayas chaye Cheta etar en havidam Stitvam sattve prasiddhati By development of devotional service one becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance and thus and thus material lust and avarice are diminished Evam prasana manaso Bhagavat bhakti yogataha Bhagavat tattva vijnanam Mukta sangasya jayate When these impurities are wiped away the candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness becomes steady uh, becomes enlivened by devotional service and understands the science of God perfectly. Vidyate hridaya grantis chidyante sarvasam saya siyante chasya karmani trista evat manishwari Thus, bhakti yoga serves the hard knot of material affection and it enables one to come at once to the stage of a samsayam samagram. Understanding of the Supreme Absolute Truth, Personality of Godhead. Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 16, Verse Number. Yadvambate Buddhi Bharavatara Krita Vatara Shahare Dharitri Antarhitasya Smarati Vir Vishris Vishrista Antartasa Samarati Vishrista Karmani Nirvana Vilambitani Translation by Srila Prabhupada Kije. O Mother Earth, the Supreme Person of Godhead Hari incarnated himself as Lord Sri Krishna just to unload your heavy burden. All his activities here are transcendental and they cement the path of liberation. You are now bereft of his presence. You are probably now thinking of those activities and feeling sorry in their absence. Purport by his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada Kijay. The activities of the Lord include liberation, but they are more relishable than the pleasure derived from nirvana or liberation. According to Srila Jiva Goswami and Vishwanatha Chakravati Thakura, 
The word used here is nirvana vilambitani, that which minimizes the, minimizes the value of liberation. To attain nirvana, liberation, one has to undergo a severe type of tapasya, austerity. But the Lord is so merciful that he incarnates to diminish the burden of the earth. Simply by remembering such activities, one can defy the pleasure derived from nirvana and reach the transcendental abode of the Lord to associate with him eternally engaged in his blissful loving service. Sila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Most people think that liberation from birth and death is the goal of life. Even materialists think that. That's why they try and they've been looking for many, many centuries for the elixir of eternal life. Ponce de Leon was a, uh, I think he was a Spaniard, and he, he uh, had to find investors to uh, have a boat that could cross the Atlantic. Just like now, uh, SpaceX and, and uh, other people are, are trying to find investors to build uh, airplane rockets that can go into space, like 100 or 200 miles, so people can uh, go up high into the sky and see the, the roundness of the earth. And one time we were on a morning walk with Priscilla Prabhupada in Paris, and we went to the Eiffel Tower and when we got there, Prabhupada looked up at it like this and said, what is that up there? And I said, uh, oh, that, that's, the, that's the Eiffel Tower, but the, what you're pointing at, that's the, a restaurant. He said, oh, it's pretty high. Yeah, it was, it was just like here we have the uh, Seattle Center and you have a tower there and, and uh, on the top of it there's a restaurant. And the Prabhupada said, oh, they're just like birds. They like to eat high in the air, you know. The birds will go very high in a tree or something and eat. So, <laughs> so Prabhupada's uh, comparison there was very funny. Everybody laughed, you know, because his way of looking at things was different. You know, we just look, we don't really see anything, you know, yeah, okay, it's the Eiffel Tower. But he notices this restaurant and he compares it to the birds that want to eat, eat very high in the sky, I think. So, <laughs> You see, uh, this idea of liberation, even the karmis have the idea of liberation, but they want to attain it in a material, mechanical way. They don't want to do it in the way that's possible. They want to do it in a way that's impossible. And that's the materialist way of looking at things because they only see a very small part of reality. They only see one quarter of reality and even they don't see the full one quarter. They see very, very little. Just like if, if you look at your, the window of your airplane going over the Pacific and all of a sudden you think, oh, let me take a picture of this. So you get a, your camera and you go like that, you take a picture, you know. The how much of the ocean that you, 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 you took a picture, let's say 25,000 feet up in the air in the airplane from the window, right? like that. How much of the ocean do you think you see? No. What do you think? You're 25,000 feet up here and you're going uh, 500 miles an hour. There might even be clouds also. <laughs> You don't see you don't you don't see even one percent of the ocean. You see one billionth of a percent of the ocean. Maybe even more, one trillionth. You know how big the Pacific Ocean is, right? And you're up there twenty five thousand feet and you have some camera, some phony camera, and you take a picture and you say, Oh, I I, I, I took a photo of the ocean, but what did you see exactly? 
nothing, almost nothing, less than less than one millionth of a of a percent. You know, not even that. So, this whole idea of uh, studying <coughs> only one up to one fourth of of uh, reality and thinking that you understand something about it. It's nonsense. I mean, they don't even understand one-fourth, right? The material world is only, the whole, all the material universes together, and there's billions of universes, is one-fourth of uh, the creation of God. So, we're, we're in a little planet in a small universe, because our Brahma only has four heads. Right? There are other universes much bigger than this one. And there's billions of them. And all of them put together is not even one-fourth of the creation of Krishna. You see? So what do the scientists actually know? They, they hardly know anything. And yet they're talking about attaining immortality or getting liberation. It's all nonsense. It, there's, no, there's no reality to it. It's, it's, it's just... Fiction, complete fiction. See, there's, there are uh, books that are non-fiction and there are books that are fiction. All the science books that they write today is fiction. Very little facts, and real facts in them. So here we see that, okay, the activities of the Lord include liberation, but they are more relishable uh, the activities of the Lord include liberation, but they are more relishable than the pleasure derived from nirvana or liberation. In other words, Krishna's pastimes, it includes liberation, yeah, but his actual pastimes are much more relishable than the liberation of the Buddhist or the liberation of the Mayavadi. The Buddhist is looking for nirvana and the Mayavadi is looking for uh, Brahman. But they're nothing compared to the transcendental activities of the Lord. So, uh, actually, uh, the word used by Srila Jiva Goswami at Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur uh, to describe liberation is nirvana vilambitani, that which minimizes the value of liberation. So, so that's right away a little shock uh, if you understand Sanskrit. To attain nirvana, liberation, one has to undergo a severe type of tapasya or austerity. But the Lord is so merciful that he incarnates to diminish the burden of the earth. So in other words, what, what, what Prabhupada is saying here is and what this verse is implying by the choice of words is that the Lord comes and gives an example of eternal bliss and knowledge. And the Mayavadis want to restrict us to severe tapasya, denying everything, uh, including the Lord, the personality of the Godhead, and uh, going through a, a very difficult, hard to perform type of austerity to attain what they call nirvana or brahman. You see? So that's why it says uh, nirvana nilambitani, that which minimizes the value of liberation. If you have to get liberated by going through such a, a very difficult process, you, you're actually uh, minimizing the value of liberation. But yet, in the, material, the materialists, they like to suffer in order to enjoy happiness. Now you might say, what, what do you mean by that? Well, there's a famous English poet named uh, Coleridge, and he said that to really taste the coolness and the uh, uh, flavor of wine, you must first eat cayenne peppers. You know what cayenne peppers are? Richie, right? Richie, right? In other words, 
you burn your tongue first and then you drink the cold wine to really appreciate the taste. See, this is nonsense. It's complete nonsense, you understand? So in the same way, what it's saying here is <laughs> that the, the word used here is nirvana vilambitani, that which minimizes the value of liberation. And why does he say minimizes the value of liberation? Because to attain nirvana, the brutus liberation, one has to undergo sev a severe type of tapasya or austerity. But the Lord is so merciful that he incarnates to diminish the burden of the earth. Simply by remembering such activities, one can defy the pleasure derived from nirvana and reach the transcendental abode of the Lord to associate with him, eternally engaged in his blissful loving service. So in other words, what he's saying is that what is the burden of the earth? The burden of the earth is uh, adi atmika, adi bodhika, adi daivika. These three types of miseries. Misery is caused by this body. Misery is caused by other bodies. <coughs> and misery is caused by natural cataclysmic events. So therefore, this is the burden of the earth. There's, there's a lot of sinful activity going on. And, and people are suffering. And Mother Earth is also suffering by the impious activities of the people. And because of that, these three types of miseries are experienced by everyone. Miseries of this body, miseries caused by other bodies, and miseries caused by natural cataclysmic events. So the Lord comes, he incarnates to diminish the burden of the earth, to stop all this sinful activity and stop this unnecessary suffering that the people are going through. Whether it's suffering to attain nirvana or it's just suffering uh, because of uh, sense gratification and greed. So if we simply remember the transcendental activities of the Lord, just like when the cowherd boys walked into the gigantic mouth of Agasura, they thought, oh, what a big cave. Let's go and explore. You know, They didn't realize it's this gigantic mouth of this huge snake, and inside uh, there is, it's dark and it's, and it's poisonous. So they walk in there, and then it's suddenly they're trapped. So what does Krishna do? He also walks in there in, with his apparently little body. And then when he gets into the throat of that gigantic snake, he begins to expand himself. So, anora aniyam, aniyam sa. In other words, the Lord is smaller than the smallest and he's bigger than the biggest. Mahina mahima. He's bigger than the biggest. So he expands himself and he chokes the snake, Agasura, and saves the cowherd boys. So, these are wonderful pastimes. They're happy. And just like the Kaliya snake, Lord, the Lord in his uh, little childish childhood body uh, enters into the Yamuna to s stop the snake from poisoning everyone. And the cowherd boys have already, in a sense, died. You know, he brings them back to life. And he jumps into the Yamuna and, and somehow or other he wrestles himself out of the tentacles of Kaliya. Kaliya has many heads and many tentacles and he's, he starts dancing on the heads of Kaliya. And every time he's kicking the head, the different heads with his feet, just like the Bharat Natyam dancing, you know, you hear, you hear them like this, you know, when they're dancing, right? And the Lord starts dancing ecstatically and every time he kicks one head of the snake, each snake spits out uh, his poison until he's completely exhausted. And, and then the wives of Kaliya, they pray to the Lord. They say, please, this is our husband. And we know he's, he's, he's a nonsense, but uh, now you've defeated him. Please uh, be merciful to him. So he said, okay, well, you go to Fiji. You get out of here. Don't never come back. You go to Fiji. You, you hang out there for the for forever. <laughs> so if you go to Fiji, they, Fiji they worship Kaliya, you know the Hindus, and uh, in a sense because he became a devotee. So we see all these pastimes are transcendental, right? It looks like the end of the world, but actually the Lord makes it a happy uh, ending. 
It used to be before then, all the movies had a happy ending. Nowadays, they make movies with sad endings, you know, miserable endings. And, and people go to get entertained, and they end up coming out crying and uh, upset and uh, full of anxiety. <laughs> you see. So uh, there's always a happy ending in Krishna's pastimes. So simply by remembering such activities, one can defy the pleasure derived from nirvana and reach the transcendental abode of the Lord to associate with him eternally, engaged in his blissful, loving service. Janma karma chame divyam ivam yo veti tatvata tyakva deham punar janma naiti maameti sarjana. So Krishna says in the fourth chapter, verse number nine, he says that One who knows the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities does not, upon leaving the body, take his birth again in this world, material world, but attains my eternal abode, O Arjuna. So this knowledge of Krishna's pastimes is so powerful that you can attain liberation, but not by sleeping on a bed of nails in a dark, dank, cold uh, cave in the Himalayas and doing... Uh, all kinds of tapasyas, or, or being immersed in the freezing waters of the Ganges in wintertime in, in uh, uh, Haridwar or, or Hrishikesh. Right? You, you don't have to do that. You can just meditate on the transcendental pastimes of the Lord and you'll attain liberation happily without going through all that suffering and be inspired by the Lord's transcendental activities. The Lord's descent from his transcendental abode is already explained in the sixth verse. One who can understand the truth of the appearance of the personality of Godhead is already liberated from material bondage, and therefore he returns to the kingdom of God immediately after quitting this present material body. Such liberation of the living entity from material bondage is not at all easy. The impersonalists and the yogis attain liberation only after much trouble and many, many births. Even then, the liber liberation they achieve, merging into the impersonal Brahma Jyoti of the Lord, is only partial. And there is the risk of returning to the material world. You see? So it's no, it's no guarantee, even though they attain, not many of them attain Brahman. Very few, in fact. But even those few, it's almost certain that they'll fall down again. Okay. So, so therefore, uh, there's a risk of returning to the material. But the devotee, simply by understanding the transcendental nature of the body and activities of the Lord, attains the abode of the Lord after ending this body and does not run the risk of returning to this material world. In the Brahma Samhita 533, it is stated that the Lord has many, many forms and incarnations. Advaitam, Achutam, Anadim, Anantarupam. Although there, may, there are many transcendental forms of the Lord, there is still one and the same Supreme Personality of Godhead. One has to understand this fact with conviction, although it is incomprehensible to mundane scholars and empiric philosophers. So, this verse is wonderful because... It's explaining, I mean, the, the verse that we read today, explaining that we don't have to go through the trouble of the Mayavadis and the Buddhists to attain liberation. We simply meditate on the pastimes of the Lord. And meditating on the pastimes of the Lord is all enjoyable. It's transcendental. It's full of bliss. And uh, if we can keep those thoughts in our mind at the moment of death, antakali kalevaram, we go back to Godhead very easily and after a very blissful enjoyable experience See? so when we can come together and hear these pastimes of the lord this is joyful this is this is encouraging it is positive there's nothing negative about it but sitting around in a dark cave and meditating alone and god forbid no cell phone uh, you know that's miserable you're wondering, oh, what's going on? I'm not getting pinged anymore. I uh, wish I brought my cell phone with me to the Himalayas. You know, it probably wouldn't work anyway. There's no cell towers there. 
So, uh, oh, they might be a few, but. So anyway, this is, we should meditate on this verse. I'll try and understand clearly what it's saying because this is the key to happiness, to bliss, and real permanent liberation. Now there's another one little point I want to make. I, I read something that confirmed something else. When we say that Brahma Jyoti is made up of an infinite number of spirit souls. Okay. So we've discussed this before, but I noticed something today uh, when I was reading Bhagavad Gita. Uh, and Prabhupada actually says it in a, in, in a purport. Uh, let's see, where, where does he say that? Hmm. Yeah, okay. So in the fifth chapter, 16, 16th verse and 20, 21st verse, let's see. Well, anyway, the 21st verse says, the Bhagavad Gita is so old, I can't even open the pages anymore. Mm. Oh, wait a minute, sorry. One second. Whenever I find new things. Okay, Brahma Jyoti, Brahma Jyoti, Brahma Jyoti. 521. 521. Oh, it's not there. 516. <clears throat> okay, we'll stop right there. I'll have to find this and get back to you on it. I found something extremely interesting and I'm not seeing it. Hare Krishna, are there any questions? Yes. Yes. Have you experienced this? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, okay, one second. You need the microphone to ask this question. Start all over and ask the question. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Uh, like one of my colleague, uh, like from five, six years back, uh, this, whenever I try to talk to him, very casually, um, but he says, yes, I know the goal of life is nirvana. And uh, after that, whatever we talk is like, it's like kind of not going anywhere. It's, so I don't, <laughs> I didn't talk after that. Okay. I tried a couple of times, very casually, but it didn't go anywhere. So, because they say, like, I know the goal of life is nirvana, and they have they have some conception they are following uh, uh, to okay. for nirvana, but uh, they they don't like after that they don't listen anything like kind of. Okay. But uh, I tried like to call them to temple. They come to temple. They're very favorable. Come quite often. Come to all the uh, festivals, but their conception of life is still there, like nirvana. So how to like uh, handle this uh, this kind of uh, situation? Okay, first let me answer my what, what I didn't find. It's the second chapter, twenty fourth verse. It says, after liberation from material contamination, the atomic soul may prefer to remain as a spiritual spark 
in the effulgent rays of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. You see? So that he's talking about being a spiritual spark in the effulgent rays in the, in the Brahma Jyoti. Right. So that also confirms, again, what we've said before. But the intelligent souls enter into spiritual planets to associate with the personality of God. Okay, so your friend says, I know what nirvana is, and he doesn't want to talk about Vaikuntha or Goloka, Krishna's pastimes. So uh, that is called the philosophy of the frog in the well. That as soon as you put a limit on your possibility of progressing spiritually, you're like the frog in the well. And you say, well, look, right now you are experiencing a family, you're experiencing festivals where a lot of people are there, you're experiencing a workplace where there are many people there, and you want to claim that the perfection of all realization is non-personal, un with no persons involved, and, and, and your, person, your personality also has to be rejected in order to attain it. When every experience you have and experiences of mostly happiness are with other individuals. So you see, it is a complete, in other words, this world is a perverted reflection of the spiritual world. That means there, there's so many people in this world, there's, there's people there also, but they're without the perverted nature. See. So he's claiming that, no, there's, there's a place where there's no people. And I'm not a real person either. I'm going to merge into that. You see. So that is a contradiction of everything that's being said in Bhagavad Gita. But if a person wants something like that, it, it exists. It's called the Brahma Jyoti. Right? But your position in Brahma Jyoti is, is not uh, permanent. You, you will definitely at some point fall back down again and start all over. Why? Because you're not taking, like let's say you go on a rocket and to outer space and you, you're aiming for Mars, but they made a mistake in calculation and it goes, it goes past Mars into space. What would happen to you? Right? You, you, you'd be dead, you know. You missed, because you have to have shelter, on, you have to take shelter on a planet. So we're talking about much greater expansion of space when you talk about Vaikuntha than the whole material creation, right? And if they just merge into the Brahma Jyoti and don't take shelter on one of the Vaikuntha planets, they're going to fall down. It's just a matter of time. Because the nature of the soul is to be active. This is explained in the third chapter of Bhagavad Gita. And in, in, in order to attain their nirvana, they have to become inactive. So if we look at the third chapter, it said, Nahi kaschit api jatu karma krit karyate hi avasa karma sarva pakritya jayaguna. Everyone is forced to act helplessly according to the qualities he has acquired from the modes of material nature. Therefore, no one can refrain from doing something, not even for a moment. You can ask him, you can say, well, you want to attain nirvana, do you want to do it by meditation? He'll say, yes. He'll say, well, well, how long are you meditating every day? he said, well, I do this uh, about 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes at night. I said, but you'll never attain your nirvana by doing that. You have to eventually do it 24 hours a day, right? Is it possible for him to do that? No. So he's talking nonsense, you see. And here it says, it is not a question of embodied life, but it is the nature of the soul to be always active. Without the presence of the spirit soul, the material body cannot move. The body is only a dead vehicle to be worked by the spirit soul, which is always active and cannot stop even for a moment. So you see, he's going to try and attain liberation by this very difficult and almost impossible process of stopping all thought stopping all interaction, stopping all activity, and meditating on some light or nothing, right? And, and 
it's almost impossible for a person to do that. Maybe there's a few people that do it. And what do they attain? They attain impersonality and just floating in this light and eventually they'll fall down because it's not the nature of the soul. Tell him, tell him, okay, look, you go and do Vipassana for 10 days. And when it's over, right, you come back again. You, you, why don't you just stay there the rest of your life? Do Vipassana. Just stay there. Don't talk. You know. And no, they can't do that. You understand? And they, they're claiming that they're going to do that eternally. It's not possible. So you start from the known to, do the, to understand the unknown. Let them go and do Vipassana. Not just for 11 days. Let him do it for, let's say, one year. Then he won't do it. He'll come back. Okay? So this verse is third chapter, fifth verse. You can't, you can't even stop for a, a minute. It's the nature of the soul to be active. And they're going to stop for eternity, say. That's nonsense. 